Hello and welcome back everybody. So good to see familiar faces and a couple new folks as well. Welcome to Formula Fitness. Today we are talking about the user and time formulas. Uh, so for those of you who may not know who I am, my name is Maria Marquis here at Coda. I focus on customer education and customer celebration. I love hosting events like this, hanging out with our customers, and just learning more about what you're doing, how we can help you, and empowering you to do your best work. Uh, lucky for all of you, I'm joined by my fantastic colleague, Thomas, who you've probably all experienced in some way, shape, or form using our little chat widget uh, since he's one of our customer champions. Thomas, want to introduce yourself to the crew today? Hey, uh, as Maria said, I am Thomas. I am one of our customer <laughs> champions here at Coda. Um, I spend my day helping users build cool Coda docs. Um, I'm sure that I've helped some of y'all build cool Coda docs mm -hmm. in the past, uh, which is always a pleasure. And uh, yeah, happy to be here to talk about some cool formulas today. Fantastic. And Thomas and I are both avid members of the Coda Cat Club. Some of our cats might make a, an entrance today. So we'll see if they, they decide they want to be part of the, the game today. Uh, so for those of you who may not have attended one of our sessions before, just a few things to know about how to get involved. Because really, you know, even though Thomas and I have things we want to share with all of you today, it's really about you and your questions. So over on the right side of the screen, you should see there's a chat area. You can post whatever's on your mind there. But if you have a question, uh, the easiest way for us to make sure we don't lose it is for you to click on the Ask a Question button right below our faces down at the bottom of the screen. That way, uh, we make sure that we can uh, log it, we don't lose it, and it's a helpful way for people to then upvote and downvote questions. So if you've got one, you can go ahead and post it in there, or you could also be like, oh, me too, I also have that question. So either one of those is going to work out just fine. Whatever helps you helps Thomas and I today. So without further ado, let's go ahead and I'm going to share my screen. Thomas, if you could just do me a solid, let me know when you can see it. So I, I know that we've all made it through time and space <laughs> through the astral plane. It. We've Perfect. got users and time for us. Oh my goodness. We are in good shape. Fantastic. So I'm going to go ahead, just collapse that uh, side piece over there. And when I was thinking about prepping today, you know, unlike some of the other formulas that we've been talking about in formula fitness, the user and time formulas are pretty straightforward. And the way that I think about them is it's kind of like adding salt and pepper to some food. It just makes it a little bit nicer. It makes a couple things pop a little bit more. So there's not as much sort of deep potential to get confused or like, oh, go down a rabbit hole here. But these are the formulas that if you start to be able to really understand them and master them, they can make your docs come alive in some really fun ways. So let's go ahead and just uh, go ahead and collapse this open so we can take a look. Also here, for those of you who don't know, we're working in what is called a collapsible list, which is one of our formatting options. You just grab it right here and it can uh, make it really nice. You've got a lot of text that you're working through. So there are a couple formula chunks that fall into this category. The first is the user formula. What this does is it creates a reference to whoever's looking at the doc. So for example, if I type equals and then I say user, it's gonna go ahead and show me my name because I'm the one looking at it. But Thomas is also in this doc. Thomas, what do you see? I see my own name. Oh my I gosh. <laughs> and when you all look in this doc, you'll see your name too. The key here though, is that this isn't just text. This is a reference because notice if I hover over my name here, it shows me all of the information about my user profile here. So my name, my email address, and also my profile picture. So the fact that it's a reference is really important because it's pulling in all of the extra contextual information in addition to just the value of Maria Marquis, which is very valuable indeed. Uh, the next two formulas here, now and today, are pretty similar. Now is gonna show you the date, the time, and up to the second, and today is just gonna show you today's date. So for example, if I type now um, equals now in here, just like so, it's going to show me everything, the date, the time, and I can watch the seconds tick by. So if you don't have a watch, you can always use this. Um, something that I think is important, though, is if you do equals and then today, this generally is a more performative formula because it's not showing you that up to the second bit. So in general, I recommend folks stick with today um, rather than now. 
Then we have these two uh, down here, created and created by, and modified and modified by. These are really similar to each other in that they show you a date, or um, a name of a person who's made a change, either a creative change or they've made some updates to a row or your doc. So it depends on, do I wanna know the person's name or the timestamp of when different actions have been taken? So those are all really helpful different things to use. Um, Thomas, of all of these formulas, which ones do you see most frequently in the docs that you're building or in the docs that you're helping folks build? Yeah, um, I, I see uh, today and user so much. Um, mm -hmm. I will say this about now. Now is one of the first formulas I look for in helping someone make their docs more performant. Um, mm -hmm. Because like you said, it is so resource intensive to tick over and over. Um, mm -hmm. you know, having that on your canvas isn't gonna bring your doc down, but when you have a really large table um, yeah. and you have a column using now, that's one of the first things that we look for. Mm -hmm. uh, and for user, I think it's such an underrated tool. Um, yeah. Being able to pull out that information, like uh, the email address or the photo, um, can go a long way. You can do some really unique interactions with that that like really spice up your doc and also make other people who are using Coda or your doc for the first time really interested. They see that yeah. personalization and they love it. Mm -hmm. Totally. And such a good call out on um, troubleshooting your own work that knowing, oh, this one is going to be really resource intensive. So if I'm noticing problems, let me see if, the, if removing it actually makes an improvement. That kind of trial and error exploration is really important, uh, an important habit for us all to really get comfortable with. So now that we know what these formula chunkers are, the things that we're working with, I'm still trying to find a good name for like component. That's probably the right formula component rather than formula chunker. That feels a little bit better. Building blocks, <laughs> um, maybe? Building blocks, yes, there we go. That's that's much better. This is why I have you here, Thomas. You can help me stay uh, stay connected. So the first exercise here is we want to create a welcome message that changes based on who's looking at your doc. In my mind, this is one of the first things that you can do if you're getting ready to share a doc with other people to make it feel more, like Thomas said, interesting, more inviting, and more customizable. So here's how it'll work. Welcome to this super awesome doc, Maria Marquis. Now let's go ahead and right click on this formula piece, what we're looking at here. So notice I've got the user formula. And then I'm saying dot name, because remember the user formula is a reference, which means it's got all of the contextual information about that person here. And I could just decide, you know, I wanna just include like we had before uh, the user, just like so. But then it kind of looks a little bit different, right? We've got the at and then the underline. And if I'm a new person coming in, that might be confusing or shocking to me. So this is why I really like when you do that user to do dot name. Just creates more text. It feels a little bit more natural. It's not as jarring visually. And to be perfectly frank, you don't need all the extra stuff here. So that's one thing that I really love. Um, the other thing you could do if you didn't want to have it be text, you could also use our friend the concatenate formula. So I could say equals uh, to say, hey, we're doing a formula. Let's do concatenate. And then maybe I want to do welcome to the doc space comma user. This is another way to do the same thing. And then I could also put a little exclamation point because I'm always exclamatory. So both of those are totally acceptable. It really just depends on, do you wanna have that formula running or not? Um, I don't think either one is better or worse. And also notice we have the little reference here. I'm gonna go ahead and change this to user.name and we can do the same thing. Uh, Thomas, as far as seeing um, how people have used just user in text, any other things besides just a welcome that you've seen people do this with? Yeah, um, you know, one thing that we've done uh, internally on our support team is we have like an on-call rotation. Uh, so who's who's in charge of the queue in a given day? And we use that for, that user formula uh, in combination with some other things to display that in docs. Uh, it's a little bit more than just the user formula, so it's probably not the best example. Uh, but being able to reference users and, and display that uh, in context is really nice. So who's on call? Who's uh, looking at this doc or things like that? Mm -hmm. um, excellent. And we're going to take a look at how you can use users and filters, which can also kind of layer on top of that.
Also, just a reminder, folks, if you've got a question today, you don't need to wait for Thomas and I to stop talking. At any point in time, if you've got a question, you just let us know by posting to ask a question. Both Thomas and I are watching that very closely. So feel free. There's no such thing as an interruption here today. It's all about you. So that's the first one, kind of a basic use of the user formula. So now let's take a look at exercise number two. So here, we're still interested in people because we have this idea of who, but we want to know who created this blog posts table. So this is actually a link to one of the tables that we have over in our little data section over here on the side. So I say, all right, the data bit, let's go ahead and just pop on over there. We've got this big blog post table. And I want to know who made that thing. This is also really great if you ever log into a doc and you're like, wait, who made this change? Who added this table? Who added this thing here? It's a great way to do some investigation. So let's go ahead and take a look. In this case, Maria Marquis is the culprit, typical, but let's see how we found that out. So I'm gonna go ahead, right click. Notice here, we're saying, first we need to say, code out what is the thing we're interested in, which is the blog post table. And then we wanna know who it was created by and as we've been seeing before, we're doing that dot name so we can see just the name. We don't need to see the reference. We just want to know that. But we could, of course, remove that if we wanted to see the whole thing. That would be perfectly fine. So this is a really important and common pattern, which is you always start with the thing in your doc that you're interested in, the table, the row, whatever it might be. Then what would you like to do with that information? Um, Thomas, for created by, um, how have, have you seen this applied in other ways before? Um, usually, it's it's like helpful to see um, who's created like a particular table or who's perhaps mm -hmm. uh, added useful objects, like an ownership system in um, yeah. knowledge bases is where I see that the most. Mm -hmm. I do think one interesting thing about the created by formula is that uh, it, it it always returns a user, so you're able to do that dot name operator even though you're not doing it technically on a user because mm -hmm. that formula always returns a user object, you can do that. And sometimes that's a bit of a leap I've seen people struggle with before. Like, yeah. how, how do I know that I can use dot name? And that's because you're always returning a user. Mm -hmm. That's a great call out. And this is the same thing would happen for modified by then as well, right? Anytime that what we're going to get is in that reference format, it means we have that ability to do the dot, which is really powerful. I also love this idea, Thomas, I hadn't thought about that, using it for an ownership system, right? Like on a page, I could say equals created by, and then now whoever creates that page, we automatically see their authorship, that's something you could do. And then you could also do modified by right by that, like this was created by this person, and it was modified by this person most recently, which is kind of cool, love that, excellent. All right, exercise number three. So here, what we want to know is who created each row in the topic voting table below. Now, this is something that we use a lot here at Coda. So we've already seen the created by um, just in, in text, right? Who created that table? But we can use this same logic on a row. Because remember, in Coda, rows are the smallest unit of measure. So a row is something we can actually be working with and taking uh, around our docs in various places. So you can use this same idea. Because maybe you want to know who is, who's uh, submitting this idea, who has this feature request, who has this question. You want to connect people with information, and that's where Created By can really come into play. So let's take a look at how this works. Let's reveal the answer. Uh, in this case, of course, Maria Marquis is still happening here. Maria Marquis is not always the answer, but in this case, it is because let's take a look at this formula here. So we're going to get click on that little F. We're going to choose Edit Formula. So here, just like before, we're saying the thing we're interested in and then what we want to do with the thing. So this row dot created by. And in this case, I thought it might be nice to have the avatar here, uh, that little image. So I'm keeping it as the full reference. But just like before, I could say dot name. I could say dot photo, which is kind of fun. Um, I could say dot email address. Whatever I want to pull from this particular information, I can do that. So I could say dot email, and that's going to pull it in here. So now we've got a little bit of a different approach. So one thing to notice is we now have this little uh, red triangle in the corner, which is telling me mm, something's not quite right. So let's go ahead and hover over it. 
So it says Maria at coda.io is not a valid person reference. Well, that's a little offensive. I think I'm a valid person. <laughs> but what we have here is this is not a reference anymore. It's just a piece of data. It's just a string. Maria at coda.io is just some text. So if we look at this column, I've chosen to make it a people column which is a reference type. So in this case, I'm comparing apples and oranges, text and a reference, which is why I'm getting that little red icon. Now, if I change this particular column format, instead of being a people, uh, instead I change it to be like text, you're gonna notice that that uh, error goes away. We're now all happy because we're comparing apples to apples. But I wanna go ahead and change my formula up back because I do just wanna have that user reference just like so, and then I'm gonna go ahead and change this particular column to be a people column here. But this is a very common pattern, this idea of like who owns the stuff in this row, who created it, who contributed it. Um, Thomas, anything else on this one that you think is kind of interesting for folks to know? Also looks like we got a question, which is great. Uh, yes, I have one quick addition here, um, and it's it's about that red triangle. Um, one of the, the things that is useful to know in Coda is that errors are often on hover. So if you mm. see that red triangle or you see an error state somewhere else in Coda, hover your mouse over it. We'll try to surface the most relevant error message to you so you can mm -hmm. solve that problem. Uh, but I would say the most common reason you're going to see that red error message is what you saw here. That's a data type mismatch, mm -hmm. um, and those are, are generally pretty easy to fix. It's just a matter of either changing that column type to match what you've put in there or changing what you've put in there to match that column mm -hmm. type. And for those of you who might be unfamiliar with this idea of data types, Thomas and I actually hosted a Formula Fitness on data types just like last week, which you can actually watch replay on our YouTube channel or on our Crowdcast channel. Either one is there. But data types, if I think about Coda and like really taking your formulas to the next level, and also just understanding like why formulas work the way they work, understanding data types is the best way to really get comfortable. Uh, Karina, I see your question here, which is, can you change it? in the formula. Could you give me a little bit more information about what it is in this situation? I think I know what you mean, but I want to make sure I fully understand it. So let me know a little bit more about uh, what you're looking for with that question. Uh, the type of the column. Can you change the type of the column in the formula? Um, in this case, Thomas, I would be interested how you approach this. I don't think that's possible because kind of the column format is um, ha has primacy. It's kind of sets the tone. What you can do is if you're not sure like what kind of data type you're gonna want in that column, I would just keep it as a text field because then it just populates with whatever's going on. Thomas, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so you can't, the, the column type is is static, it's supreme. You mm -hmm. couldn't change that from the formula, but you can change the output of your content. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, in this case, you know, if it was a text column and you were providing a people object, you could in the formula turn that to text um, with the to text mm -hmm. uh, e uh, formula. Uh, granted, it's much easier just to use the name or the other text attributes from the people column. But broadly speaking, uh, the column is the same. It's the output that you have control over mm -hmm. in a formula, although ultimately you can change a column type manually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in this case, again, if you're if you're not sure, like notice here, I'm saying email. I don't get that uh, little red triangle anymore because it's just text in this case. Um, and I've got the edit formula. If I change this to name, go ahead and say great name. Go ahead and add that. It's fine. Um, and then if I come back here and I say created by, and then let's use what Thomas was talking about. Uh, dot to text. So I'm just changing this reference to a text field. We can go ahead and pop that in. And the text allowed this text column format is sort of a catch all. It's not making any assumptions about what's inside of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great question. Love that, Karina. Perfect. All righty. So let's take a look at exercise number four. But I'm going to go ahead and change this back to be uh, since this is the exercise doc that we'll be sharing with all of you afterwards, I'm going to go ahead and just change this formula back and change that. Uh, excellent. There we go. Everything's editable for a reason, after all. All right. So let's take a look at exercise number four. So we're going to collapse three. Here we go. So now what we want to know is we want to know who modified each row in the table below. 
So in this case, uh, oh, not the topic table. We're going to say in the pulse table below. So the question here is, how do you feel about cats? And of course, Thomas and I both feel very pro-cat, very positive about it. Um, this is actually a very uh, simple meeting template that we use here at Coda in pretty much every meeting that we do. This idea of just getting a pulse check on like, how do people feel about something? How do we feel about this moving forward? How are people feeling today? You know, are you low energy or are you high energy? So this is a very common ritual that we do here at Coda. Um, and one of the things that makes it work is this idea of when was it last changed? So let's go ahead and take a look at the answer. So here, what we're doing is very similar to what we just saw with the created by. But in this case, we're choosing submitted by and we're using the modified by option instead. So let's take a look at this formula here. So here we're saying this row, when was it modified by? Who was it modified by? What did they do? Why this is helpful here is that if we're going to use this same table for our check-ins every single week, I could go ahead and say, well, this is now me and I'm going to feel, you know, I feel okay this week. So you can have that modified by cycle through. So if you're going to be using the same row and updating it over and over again, modified by can be really helpful. Or if you're having multiple people making changes, maybe each one of these is a customer account and people are posting updates. You want to know the last person who updated that customer's record, that's going to be able to pull it in there. Looks like we got a question. Let's take a look. Um, ah, great question, Karina. So why is this one in parentheses instead of with a period? You caught me, Karina. And that's because it's a teachable moment. So thank you for noticing that. In this case, um, it's really um, a matter of preference. So the cool thing about this formula is you can do modified by and then this row. You want to know what's the thing that was modified. But I could also get the same result by doing what we saw before. This row dot modified by. It's going to get me the same information. It's This is something that allows folks who maybe uh, used to work a lot in Excel, uh, that same syntax, that same order, what you've seen in Excel, is going to work with this formula too. So either one works. My personal preference is to actually do it like this, this row dot modified by. I just find it's a little bit easier to track and I don't get lost in parentheses. But either one will work perfectly well for you. Uh, Thomas, anything on this syntax thing that you'd like to share? Oh, yeah. I have lots of thoughts on this syntax Tell me thing. all your but, feelings uh, about But frankly, it. What, you said, <laughs> what you said is true. Both work and both are totally valid. Um, I find that if I'm doing just one thing, uh, so if I was just doing modified by, I, I do use the parentheses. Uh, but anytime I'm using more than one formula, mm -hmm. I absolutely use the dot notation and chain those together. And I believe that makes things a little bit more readable. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is uh, totally up to you. Um, and it's helpful to, to, to see what feels best for you because ultimately, while the formulas are important to get right, it's just as critical that the formulas are readable to you after the fact so that you can go back and understand what's happening. Um, and that's why I, I think it's so important to, to write your own formulas and to really, really know them because those formulas live forever and you want to be able to go back to them and adjust or modify or understand them as your needs change. Mm -hmm. I love that, Thomas. And I'm so glad you're bringing it up because um, it's about understanding the choices that past you made, right? Um, so that you can be like, wait, what was I trying to do here? And sometimes if you have all the nested parentheses, it just can be hard to like parse apart what you were thinking about. Whereas, and that's why we've written our formula language to support this dot operator approach, because it lets you write it like a sentence. I also find that uh, the dot operator is easier for people who are not you then to better understand what's going on here as well. Um, so just a little bit of a note there, but I think Thomas is totally correct in this. If you're just doing one thing, using parentheses is fine, but honestly, it's about what makes sense to your brain. Um, and that's really the most important thing. Yeah, great call out, Karina. Thank you. All right, so let's take a look at the next exercise. So we're gonna go ahead, get out of this particular little view, close up exercise number four, thank you, and move to exercise number five. So now this is another really um, simple, straightforward thing, which is what day and time is it? So here, this is really helpful if you ever want to have a timestamp on your notes, or if you want to uh, just be able to be very clear about like where we're at, or if you want to just have a clock in your doc, all of that is possible. 
So here there are two options, the today formula, which we saw at the top, and then the now formula, which again, word of warning, you want to make sure you're using now judiciously uh, so that you're not causing any potential problems in your doc. Um, in this case, having one now formula, totally fine. But if you have like 12 now formulas across your doc, it might be a little bit much. So I just include this because it can be really helpful um, to just create that like database, that approach. Thomas, any other ways that you see today or now used in isolation in docs? Um. In isolation, this is generally the way that I see it used mm -hmm. the most. Um, just being yeah. able to quickly log uh, what's going on. Um, they're mm -hmm. essential um, building blocks in the long term, but uh, this yep. is generally the most basic way to see it used. Mm -hmm. Cool. So let's take a look at exercise number six, because this is where we actually can start to combine those date and time formulas into something that gives us some information. So maybe I have this table full of blog posts and I have the date they were published and I want to know, you know, is, is this blog post out of date? How long ago was it published? And obviously that's going to change every single day. So I could go through and update <laughs> my changes every single day of how many days have passed, but that's probably not a good use of my time. So what we can do is we can use these time formulas to help give us that information. So let's go ahead and take a look. We're going to reveal the answer here. In this case, uh, May 26 was 150 days, 12 hours, and 30 minutes ago. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my formula so you can see it. Let's just edit it. And here what I'm doing is I'm using that today formula minus the date published, which is that column. So this is going to let me know, based on today, where I am in time, how long ago was that particular item published? Now, I think I could actually make this to be two days. There we go. So we don't have any of that extra stuff. Nope, that's not going to work. Oh, because it makes it into a date formula, and we want to have this be a duration. Again, data types are back at play. Um, but this is a really helpful way to start to work. Also, another way that I really like to use the today formula is to create a bit of a countdown. So here we've got how long ago this happened. But the other thing that I could do is I could say, maybe we've got, um, maybe Thomas, when's your birthday? August 2nd, 1990. Oh. Okay. Today minus, oh wait, let's see. I want to do the date minus today. So the date in this case, 2021 of August 2nd. I wasn't paying attention. Oh, yes, yes, that's it. I you don't have that written down on your calendar? <laughs> well, I will now because of CODA. <laughs> it's minus today. So this can let me know with the date minus today. Let's go ahead and press enter. Oh, that didn't work. Let's see. Let's figure out why this isn't working. Ah, extra close parentheses found. Well, let's go ahead and just remove that. So it is 279 days until Thomas's birthday. So it's a great way to just kind of put that there. So you could say now until. Oh, it looks like the formula might have been blocked by our faces. Oh, interesting. Well, let's go ahead and just uh, scroll down a bit. And we're going to right click. So here I'm putting the date, in this case, the year, the month, the day, minus today. So this lets me know how many days until that event. So a little bit of CODA history. Uh, when I started at CODA, we were just getting ready to go out of our beta and tell the world what we were doing. So in our doc that we were using to manage our launch out of beta, we had a countdown until the day we had chosen to launch. So it was kind of a great way to have a little bit of um, excitement building up to it. Now, if you want super exciting countdowns, instead of using today, you can use now which will give you that by the second countdown until Thomas's birthday. So a nice way to add a little bit of fun there. But I really love to do that countdown. And again, here what we're doing is we're just using the date where you pick a date in time and then how long until that moment, minus today or minus now, can both be really helpful ways uh, to get that happening. That's another fun way to use it. Uh, Thomas, do you ever see um, sort of how else do you see today or now being used in combination with other formula components and building blocks? 
Yeah, countdowns are a big, big part of it. Um, being able to uh, f like filter for certain mm -hmm. time ranges, you know, uh, you want to see the projects that are due within the next week or the next yeah. month. Uh, those are those are really big ones. Um, I see that a lot in project planning docs mm -hmm. um, and in task managers. Um, obviously, counting down to important events like my birthday is is key. Critical. Um, but there's so many other ways you can use them, um, mm -hmm. especially. Uh, in that context of project management. I think that's yep. where I see the most date usage. Mm -hmm. And just a, a little call out that if you wanted to have a just sort of a date control in your doc, right? So I could be like, oh, I wanna let's see, I'll just add it down here. I'm gonna scroll up so we have uh, don't have face issues. So we could say a uh, date selector, here we go, like a date range, just like so. I'm gonna add that here. And then maybe I wanna have a filter off of this. So I'm gonna go up to the top. I'm gonna say I wanna filter this particular thing, add a filter where the date published is using an interactive filter. And in this case, it's gonna be that date range picker. Now that all of this, uh, this particular setup is using those different pieces of logic. So here, if I click on my date range picker, notice we can now say the last seven days, the last 30 days, last month, last week, um, last year. I also really like uh, for the future, you can use uh, the next, let's see, present here. I could use the last seven and next seven days as a filter off of that. And this is all using the today and the now formula in the back end, but just sort of helping from there. So a helpful bit of uh, a w something to add to project tracker docs in particular. So we're gonna go ahead and just remove that filter, kill it off. We don't need it anymore. All right, nice, cool. So it looks like we got some more questions coming in, which is fantastic. Let's go ahead and take a look at those. All right. The question is, are today now and now aligned with our time zones? Thomas, that is correct. The time zone on the dock um, matches to the, the today and now. The time zone on the dock. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it's not going to match your time zone automatically. But for every doc, you can change the time zone of it because maybe you want this doc to operate on Eastern, this doc to operate on Central European, this doc to operate on Singapore time. So you choose the time zone for the doc and then today and now will be aligned to that. Awesome question, Christian. All right, do we have to create the interactive filter first or can you do it as one step from the column? Great question, Karina. This is actually my favorite little coda trick and it's something that i love because it's just recently been made available so you can actually now go the other way around so before you used to have to create the control and then connect the filter but now you can come to the filter here so this is off of the column i'm interested in i can then choose interactive filter and it'll create a control just like so and it's automatically going to create all of that alignment for me so notice that just happened magically. This now is working here, um, just like we saw before. Yeah, so you can go either way. It kind of depends on, I think, sort of where you're at with your building, right? So for example, if, I'm, if I know exactly what I wanna build, I probably might build that you know, first. Like, oh yeah, I wanna have my control and I'm gonna connect it here. But if you're you know, sort of building your dock and you're realizing, ah, oh, I'd really like to be able to view this ever growing table in a new way, you can then create the control from the table. So you don't always need to kind of uh, follow a certain order of operations, if you will. Yeah, great question. I, I will say this about those filters that we can automatically add for you. Um, they're a great learning tool. Um, if you yeah. don't know how to write the filter yourself, and I, I find myself doing this to double check things quite mm -hmm. a bit, I'll add that in automatically. Then yeah. go look at the filter on the table and, and see how the formula is written. Um, and it's a great way totally. to get some, some context on how you could write formulas, but also then to amend those formulas if you need them to do something slightly different. Mm -hmm. um, and it goes a long way, uh, super useful, and also very fast way to get those controls onto your uh, doc. Yeah, that's such a good call out, Thomas. I'm so glad you're bringing this up because just because something happens kind of magically, like through this setup, or maybe you drag and drop one of our drag and drop templates in, just because it happens magically doesn't mean you can't look under the hood. Go ahead and right click on stuff, see how those formulas are made. You'll start to notice patterns and you'll be like, huh, okay, we're using matches here. I wonder where else I could use that. And this now becomes part of the language that you are empowered to work with. So it's such a good call out, Thomas, yes. And to be perfectly honest, that's actually how I learned a lot of my code of formula stuff is just by seeing, what is this person made here? 
oh, I want to check out how this filter is working behind the scenes. And that's a great way to be able to just start to grow and learn and explore and start to notice those patterns. Um, excellent. Cool. So now let's take a look at exercise number seven here, which is when was the last time the categories table was edited? Oh, and actually there's a question here. I want to answer that first because your questions are most important. Uh, this is from Christian, which is the time-based automations are kind of fixed. Are there any plans to trigger an automation on a formula output? Like I want to send an email every second day of the new quarter. Ooh, this is a very good question. Um, Thomas, what do you think about kind of this setup here? As yeah, far as options. So uh, right now, there there isn't more granular controls in the way to launch our automations, um, mm -hmm. but you can recreate what you're after. Um, it just takes more steps. Uh, for example, you if you wanted something to trigger every second day of the new quarter, you could potentially write a formula in your mm -hmm. uh, table that checks a box um, every second day and then unchecks it and then use an automation that looks for changes to a row and filters mm -hmm. for that column changing to get you what you're after. But yep. I agree that we, we want to, and I believe we intend to in the future, mm -hmm. expand the automation triggering options to give you that granularity without having to set up that stuff. But I think one of the amazing things about Coda is even if something isn't a feature we've built in, you can often do it um, yeah. just by using our formula language. <laughs> totally. And one thing that also might be an option here, Christian, this reminds me of a doc that I have um, that what happens is it has buttons that push to trigger certain things that happen. But um, I have uh, a formula that disables buttons that don't meet my criteria. So I have an automation that's, uh, that pushes buttons every day. But I, in my table, I've disabled buttons if they don't meet the criteria of um, part of this project. And you could do the same thing with dates. So that might be a way to work around it. But uh, yes, at this point in time, our automations engine is rather fixed, but it's definitely something that we want to be investing in more in the future. Great question. Yeah. Oh, and then uh, we've got something from Jean-Pierre here. Oh yeah, a view of the table and keep the original not touched and then put a view on your filter and the detailed view gives a lot of other possibilities. Great call at Jean-Pierre. Yeah, <laughs> Thomas agrees. <laughs> We're so aligned, Thomas. We're so aligned. <laughs> nice. All right, so let's take a look at this uh, exercise seven, which is much simpler than um, what we were just chatting about. Um, but we wanna know when was the last time the categories table was edited? This again is really helpful to understand like what are people doing? Like I wanna know who was the last person to touch the categories table. So I know if something shows up, we actually have a little bit of a, sort of a CSI forensics capability um, in this case to be able to understand like how people are working with it. Of course we have version history inside of Coda, but sometimes this is just easier to know when was the last time this was touched? Or if you have articles, when was the last time someone wrote this article or made a change? So here, uh, in this case, we are using the now formula. So we've got categories and modified. Now modified, just like when we were talking about modified by and created by, that gives us a user reference. Modified is always going to give us a date and time. So that just happens automatically uh, using that kind of now logic behind the scenes. But this is a really helpful thing to do. You could also then connect it. It was last edited on this by equals uh, categories table dot modified by. And now we can get all of the information about what was happening. Um, Thomas, any other ways that you see the modified um, formula being used in, in docs that you see coming across your desk? Ooh, uh, there's not a whole, whole. I mean, they're usually in big parts of, mm -hmm. of more complicated formulas. Sure. Um, I personally like to see it uh, as kind of like a, a, a quick check, you know, um, if for, for programmers, get blame mm -hmm. comes to mind, like who <laughs> made this change and, and when uh, is kind yeah. of uh, crucial for me, um, especially mm -hmm. in those like contexts of like knowledge base or like production environments. Yep. You want to know when the change was made and by whom, uh, so you can mm -hmm. keep track of that sort of work. Totally. Um, and I know uh, for us, uh, for, for my team, I do a lot of video work. And so we actually use this to really understand when was the last time someone uh, started touching a project, which can be really helpful. But yeah, this is very much the, the get blame <laughs> formula now that I think about it. <laughs> 
<laughs> Excellent. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to give a little bit of a bonus, which is how, one of the ways that I really like to use the user formula to, number one, help people be able to focus on just what they need to worry about. And also, it gives you some opportunities to do some data control in lieu of more formal permissions. So how this will work, I'm going to go ahead over here. Let's go to the data table just so we can see what's going on and the, the things that we're working with. We've got this blog post table and we have this uh, table here, not table, this column with the author, which is a user reference. I know that because if I hover over it, I see all the goodies underneath. But maybe what I want to do, and this is great if you're dealing with tasks or customer accounts, be able to just have a place where people know where is my stuff. So what we could do is we have two options. The first thing we could do is we could make a new page over here on the side, call this my stuff, and we could make a view. So I'm gonna do slash table, which is gonna let me pull in a table option here. And uh, in this case, instead of creating a new table, I'm gonna say, go to the blog post table, and I'm gonna do a little filter. So over here on the side, I'm gonna choose filter, add a filter, and we're gonna say the author. And then because code is great, we've actually added this ability to just say the current user, which is using that user formula. So like Thomas recommended, if I switch over to this uh, filter formula uh, view, it lets me know it's gonna show that user. And in this case, it's saying contains because it's helping us out. Maybe there were multiple authors. So contains allows us to make sure we pull any time we've been mentioned once because contains helps us connect multiple data sets together. So now that's one way. We've got our place that just shows me my stuff. You could say, hey, everybody, when you go to the doc, just go to the my stuff area. You could even make a really uh, aggressive icon here. So like a maybe a pointer. <laughs> um, and we could say, go ahead. Let's see, this one's good. Like my stuff, it's right here, go here. Um, so that's one way. But in this case, the data is still visible. So folks could go and take a look at everything. So what you could do instead is you could have your core table, let's just go ahead and remove this page, you could have your core table only ever show the core information for the person. So you could actually filter this table by clicking filter, adding a filter, author, and then the current user, just like we saw before. So that table is always only showing you information that has you mentioned. That's another way to do it. A third way, and definitely the more secure option, if it's about security, maybe you've got a table full of performance reviews. You obviously don't want everybody to see everyone's performance reviews. You could go ahead and use Crossdoc to pull in just a view of the table that is for that person. And this is actually something that we do at Coda to distribute our feedback uh, to each other every single, every other month or so. So all of those are an option. Again, just using that user formula to only show you what is relevant to you. Thomas, anything else on how you see this used uh, to solve that problem? Um, honestly, I think you really touched upon the best use cases for that. Mm -hmm. And I, I wish I had something clever to add. Uh, well, you know, that's all right. Uh, Karina is wondering how we how we show that cross doc for sure. So let's go ahead and take a look. I'm going to just go up here to the top. I'm going to say coda.new. This is a great way to just create a new coda doc whenever you want to. And the way that I would get to cross doc <clears throat> is I just do a little dance while I wait for this to, to come out. <laughs> um, and what we do is we have that over here under packs. And oh, actually, no. Oh, I'm in the explore menu. That's why I'm going to the gear menu. And oh, goodness, we've moved this around. Look at me. I think you had it in explore and in then explore, packs before. And then packs. Oh, yes, that's right. I, if you did down here, as go to doc yeah. and cross doc. There we go. See, we've moved it around. It used to be another tab. See, even I still make mistakes. I'm not perfect. <laughs> We're all we're all in process. So the first thing you would do is you just sign in with your Coda account to connect the one that you're looking for, and then you could pull in tables as you saw fit. So since I'm already over here, um, let's go ahead and just go to our Explore and our Packs, and I'm going to go up here and search, which is what I should have done before. Cross doc. There we go. All right. So. 
just do a little thing. There we go, perfect. And now I'm gonna go over here, cross dock, boop, boop, line on in. So making that connection, which only happens once. And then now maybe I want to, let's see, formula fitness is the dock that I'm looking for. So here we go, user and time. This is the dock. It's gonna show me all the tables that are in it. And I've got this particular blog post table I can drag in. So then I could go ahead and filter it if I wanted to. But one thing that I actually like to do is I like to actually create a little separate uh, table with the view that I'm looking for. And then I just pull in the view um, here. So I would see it listed like blog post two could have been a view that I would made. I drag and drop it in. So this is a great way to kind of pull it in. And then the cool thing about this that I really like actually is when you do that drag and drop, it pulls in that information from the other place. And then it can kind of be, now it's mine, right? So I'm pushing out that information, I'm getting it, but I can then start to annotate all of these things. So it becomes like my personal note taking place that nobody else can see. Uh, but yeah, so you'll just make the filter that you want in this core doc, and then you'll just cross dock that particular view in, and that allows you to keep everything nice and clean. Yeah. Uh, uh, Karina, for your question about does pulling the view share the extra information, it does not. And this no. is um, what's 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 great about this uh, is that you can use this as as a sort of way to share just a single page because code of permissions don't work on a page level; they only work at the doc level. Uh, yep. This is a pretty common request we hear in support. Oh, I only want them to see this table or their view of the table. And this is the best way to do that. So, you yep. know, we see that a lot where, oh, I want to just show my client's tasks to that one client, but I want to be able to keep all of my tasks in one table. Mm -hmm. So you can cross stock out their tasks to get just that. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a uh, very useful thing. Um, it will get updated, it will. but it yes. will go back. Mm -hmm. That's right. So the way to think about cross stock is it's like a hub and spokes. Right, you've got that core piece of information and you can push it out everywhere and it's gonna continue to push out the updates. It just doesn't go two way yet. But uh, let me just show you here in our little crosstalk, one of the things that you do once you set it up, notice here it says last synced two seconds ago. You could decide how often you want it to sync by just clicking on that little um, edit option, just like so. Now you could say, great, I want to have this refresh manually or every day or every hour. Um, and you could also say, you know, maybe you only want the first thousand rows to come through. Um, and then you also decide which place to go with. So it's a way for you to decide, you know, what makes sense in that case. Mm -hmm. And then you can always just do uh, when, when you're in it, if you want to just know, hey, did I get the right stuff? You just click on this little refresh and it'll automatically do a sync just like manually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it is really, it's one of those things where it's a pretty simple idea, right? Like, I just want to push information out. But once you realize what that opens up, it's like, oh, now I don't have to have multiple places to update. And I don't have to do this. You just can push it out there. Uh, formulas work across cross doc too. Whatever formulas you have that are operating in your table will get pushed through. And then you can also use formulas on that crosstalk table. So if you wanna then be able to work on, you know, adjusting formulas in that new place, you certainly can. <clears throat> One yeah. caveat to that. Yes, uh, please, if, if your crosstalk references other tables, for example, uh, mm. you know, this had a look up to a different table on it, you do need to crosstalk that table in as well mm -hmm. um, so that it can reference that table. It can only reference tables within that doc, so you can just cross dock mm -hmm. both of them in. Mm -hmm. uh, a good example of this is if I'm doing OKRs, right? I might have a table of our objectives and then a table of our key results that looks up to the objectives to pull it in. I want to make sure I pull both of those in because otherwise uh, that table's missing. And then the one table is like, wait, where's my friend? I'm not able to get this information. Uh, but that'll be something that if, if that happens to you, you'll be able to see it very clearly in there. And then just remember, you can always, if maybe in that core table that you're using to look up, if there's some other stuff you don't want people to see, you can always just pull in a view of just the part of that table that you want people to see and be able to work from there. Yeah, excellent. So those are all the exercises we wanted to work through with all of you today. I'm gonna to share the document link over in chat, but please let us know what other questions you have. Uh, we wanna make sure that if there's anything else on your mind that we can support you. After all, that is why Thomas and I are here today is to make sure you leave those questions answered. So let us know what else we can help you with today.
And Glad if you're like, I'm good, <laughs> that's fine too. <laughs> all righty. Let's see. We're going to share. Nice. Copy this link. And I think that's all set up appropriately. Oh, Karina, do not apologize for all your questions. That's what makes these fun. The more questions you all ask, the more we can dig in deeper. You know, Thomas and I don't, we're not mind readers. So we don't know what are the things that are going to be most helpful. So the questions that you all ask is really what makes us most excited to do these projects. So please keep them coming. That's, that's why we do this. Otherwise, it would just be Thomas and I talking to each other in a vacuum, which while fun, wouldn't be as great as us having a full conversation around how this applies and comes alive in the docs that you all have. Yeah. I'm also very confident the questions that you ask are questions that other people have. Totally. So it helps everyone in the group. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And um, it's also one of those things that it helps Thomas and I like keep on our toes too, right? It helps us learn new things and it helps us realize, oh, this actually should be something we do differently in, in our in our product and lets us talk to our product team. Thanks, Yoast. Good to see you. Excellent. All right, y'all. Well, it looks like questions have come to an end. We're going to go ahead and close out today. Again, remember that you can always uh, re-watch uh, all of our other Formula Fitness if you miss them uh, at our Crowdcast channel, which I've got over there, as well as our YouTube channel. Both work out totally fine. And it's been a true pleasure. Always fun working with you. Thomas, thank you so much for being my co-host today. I always love Happy when we get too. to hang out. And uh, we'll see you next time. All right, y'all. Have a great rest of your day. Happy coding.